bring you greetings from the Fusion Atlanta church plant there. It's an urban church plant in Atlanta that I've had the privilege now to be there for. We've been there for two months now. And God is blessing. We solicit your prayers as we are trying to create revolutionary disciples for Jesus Christ there in Atlanta. We want to be able to turn the city upside down for the glory of God using in any and every available approach to reach people, removing any boundaries or hindrances or obstacles so that people can come to see Jesus. And so we solicit your prayers and we thank God for this opportunity to serve. Now today I do have a word from the Lord. It's not my word, it's his. And so I want to invite you to 1 Samuel 14. Once we read this, you'll begin to discover and see why the Lord has orchestrated this as we deal with the theme of this series, Grownish. Today, this fits right in. It's 1 Samuel 14, and I'm going to read in your hearing verses 1 down through 10. If you would stand on your feet for the reading of God's holy word. As we prepare to see what he has to say to us in 1 Samuel 14, I'll read from the English Standard Version. You could read along in whatever version that you may have silently as I read audibly. If you're ready, say yes. Yeah. Here's what the word says. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gebeah in the pomegranate cave at Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of the one was Bozes and the name of the other Senna. The one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash and the other on the south in front of Geba. Verse 6, Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come. Let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Huh, pay attention to this. Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be the sign to us. I want to point you back to verse 6. Jonathan said to the young man, Come, let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Turn to your neighbor, the person beside you, and say, Neighbor, I hope you discover the power of maybe. Uh, find another neighbor on the other side. Find another neighbor on the other side. And tell neighbor, oh neighbor, I hope you discover the power of maybe. Remain standing for prayer. I'm going to preach the power of maybe. Father, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. I read the true account many, many years ago in Kansas City, Missouri, when the circus came to town. All of the people gathered there to see all of the great feats they would do under the big tent 
They had those who would fly high and do acrobatic flips high in the sky. There were those who could contort and twist their bodies in different and strange ways. But one of the great attractions under this circus in Kansas City, Missouri, many years ago was a very rare white Bengal tiger that they had in a very large cage. A man came out and got into the cage with this dangerous tiger, armed with nothing more than a whip. And as he cracked his whip, the tiger, this dangerous tiger, would do whatever the man commanded. <clears throat> he would yell out, a command, crack the whip, and the tiger would stand up on his hind legs. He would crack the whip and use the power of his word command, and the tiger would roll over like a dog until the unexpected happened. <clears throat> the power went out. All of the lights went out. It was so dark that you could not see your hand in front of your face. And it was, and it was this, that when, as the power went out, this man was locked in the cage with a dangerous tiger. Now he was not able to see the tiger. No one could see anything. And what seemed like an eternity, although it was only two minutes, went by. And in the darkness, all they could hear was the man cracking his whip and giving commands in the darkness. When the power came back on, the man came out of the cage unharmed. They interviewed him and asked him, how in the world did you deal with this tiger in the darkness? He said, I dealt with it because, number one, the tiger didn't know the lights went out. So I had to keep doing in the darkness what I had done in the light. They said, but how could you make it through? He said, well, what I had to do was I had my word. And see, the same word that made him obey in the light is the same word that would make him obey in the darkness. He said, now the power went out, but the power of my words still made the tiger behave. He said, so I guess when you get locked in a cage with a tiger in the dark, you got to just keep talking in the dark. And I wonder who I'm talking to this morning who has been locked in a situation, something unexpected happened, you didn't plan on it happening. But let me tell you something, the devil can do a lot of things to you, but he cannot take away the power of your word. And if you just keep doing in the darkness... What you've done in the light, then God will bring you out. See, what I like about this true account is the fact that this man understood that he did not have to be afraid because of the unexpected, nor did he have to be afraid because he was unarmed. He used the power of his words. Now, 1 Samuel 14 tells us that Saul and his 600-man army are in the, in the darkness with a tiger. It is a metaphorical tiger, for it is the Philistines. And the context is, in 1 Samuel 13, that the Philistines are 30,000 in number, and Saul only has 600. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. Saul and his fighting men are not on the battlefield to fight the Philistines. They are cowering in a cave. They are afraid because they don't have enough weapons and they don't have enough men. How can you fight when you've only got 600 and the enemy has 30,000? Not just 30,000, but chariots and, and horsemen and infantry and weapons. They are outmanned and they are outgunned. I want you to notice that Saul and his 600 men, these, this army, are cowering in a cave. But the Bible says that Jonathan, his son, sneaks away from the group that's hiding in the cave. He takes one of the young men who is his armor bearer. He goes to a different place outside of the cave, positioned where he can see the Philistines across this cavern. 
And as he looks at the garrison of the Philistines, which could be anywhere between a hundred to a thousand men across that cavern, he does something that is strange, something that most of us would never dream of doing, something that seemed ridiculous. He looks at his armor bearer and he says, come with me and let's attack these Philistines. He does not say, let's go get the 600 fighting men. He just turns to one other guy and says, come with me and let us attack the Philistines. Here it is, because it may be that the Lord will deliver them into our hands. You're not with me, but you're going to get with me in a minute. Jonathan has a crazy idea of faith. He has an idea to attack the Philistines, and he's, he's trying to go forward on a maybe. Okay. Look at the juxtaposition of these two groups. Look at the different approaches. Saul is the king. He has the position. Yet he's hiding in a cave with 600 soldiers, watch this, waiting to see what God will say. But Jonathan is in a position to see the enemy. All he's got is a ride or die armor bearer. And he's not sitting around waiting. He's dreaming of what God can do. Mm, I'm going somewhere. Saul is waiting on the Lord to show him a sign. His position, help me to preach this Holy Ghost. Saul's position is one of defense. He's waiting on the Philistines to make their next move so that he can react to what the enemy does. And that's Saul's problem. He's playing defense. And that's our problem. We're playing defense. Okay, you're not feeling me. Let me go to the Bible. Bible says in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus, while talking to the disciples, says, Upon this rock, pointing to himself, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You might have missed uh, the profundity of that statement, for gates are preventative and defensive measures that are meant to give you access or to secure a place. Gates are for the defense of a city or a house. So what Jesus was actually saying is, the church was never called to play defense. The church was called to play offense. In other words, we are supposed to be attacking the kingdom of Satan so that the gates of hell will not prevail against our attack. But the problem with our church is that we keep playing defense, reacting to what the enemy does, reacting to what the enemy brings our way. Don't you know we are called to take the fight to the enemy? We're actually, I was taught when I was young not to pick a fight. But in the spirit, God's children are called to pick fights. We're supposed to see every place that the enemy is ruling, and we are supposed to come against it with the authority of the kingdom of heaven. We are not supposed to stand around, oh, I wish I had a church here, and, and just react to everything that the culture is doing. The church is too politically correct today. We don't want to be offensive, and so therefore we allow souls to be snatched by the enemy. But I wonder if there's anybody here that knows that you are called to be on the offense, not the defense. See, let me bring it back full circle, the power of what John Jonathan was saying is he saying I'm not going to wait for the enemy to attack me I'm going to attack the enemy and and as you think about this this thing of grown ish of 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 being spiritually mature here's where I want to land today and that is that when you have mature faith in God it moves you to go forward on a maybe okay okay Y'all going to make me work hard this time. All right, here it is. 
Uh, mature faith moves you to a place where you go forward in faith not knowing all the details of the plan. Oh, now this is going to disturb some of you, so hang with me. This is going to disturb because this is a paradigm shift. Notice in the text, Jonathan does not pray. It's going to challenge you. Um, notice he does not hear a voice from heaven. There is no writing on the wall to tell Jonathan what to do. He gets mm, no sign from God that this is what he is supposed to do. He just comes up with a crazy idea and goes forward on a maybe. Now, I know what denomination I'm from, and I know what church I'm in, I, and, and I understand there's somebody who's, who's struggling right now to wrap your mind around this concept because we are taught implicitly that this could be presumption. He has not heard a word. He hadn't gone to an all-night prayer meeting. He hasn't fasted, and yet he's going to go ahead on a maybe. So, so why would God bless him by going forward on a maybe? Shouldn't he hear a word from the Lord? Shouldn't he get a sign from God? But understand, there's some prerequisites for going forward on a maybe. If you're still with me, shout yes. There are certain criteria you must meet in order to go forward on a maybe. See, see, there is such a thing as being presumptuous. Sometimes we can be too impatient with God, so we put our hands on stuff that doesn't belong to us. Mm -hmm. Can I come a little bit closer? 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 13, 8 and 9, read it when you go home. The prophet Samuel told Saul, now go up there and, and what I need you to do is wait for me seven days. On, on the seventh day or within seven days, I will come. I will offer a burnt offering and then I'll give you some words of instruction. But seven days went by and, and the prophet Samuel was delayed in coming. So what did Saul do? He said, give me, give me the offering. I'll offer it up even though, watch this, even though the prophet told me not to. Saul got worried that Samuel wouldn't come, so he did the job that was assigned only to Samuel. How many times have we become impatient with God and did exactly what we knew we shouldn't do because God was taking too long? Come here, come here, come here. So you single, and because God uh, seems to have forgotten that your biological clock is ticking, you will then put your hands on not a man, uh, not the right man, but a man, because God obviously needs your help because he's taking too long. Come here, brother. God is taking too long to bless you, so you put your hands on stuff that doesn't belong to you. Sometimes we get so impatient we manipulate a miracle and it becomes a mess. Okay. Can I preach it like I feel it? You see, um, some things don't require prayer because God has already made it plain. There's some stuff you ain't got to pray about. I know that sounds wrong coming from a preacher, but, but the truth of the matter is some stuff you ought not waste your time praying about because God already told you. You don't have to pray, married man, if you should be on the phone late at night with that sister trading pictures. You... You ain't got to pray about that. It's already been made clear in his word. You, you ain't got to pray about whether you should lie or cheat on the job in order to get the promotion. It's already been made clear in his word. You don't have to pray about whether you should talk about people behind their back. It's already been made clear, clear in his word. See, Saul knew the instructions of God, but he was too impatient, so he went outside of God's will and then expected God to bless his mess. Too impatient. That's how you wander into presumption. But there's another way that you can wander into presumption. Not just, watch this, not just being impatient, but also being fearful. 
See, Saul was fearful of losing what God gave him. 1 Samuel 13, again, 8 and 9, Samuel didn't come when he thought he would, and the people started leaving Saul. So watch this. Saul offered up that offering because his primary motivation was actually fear of losing what God had given him. And when fear of loss is your motivation, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, if you fear losing what God has given you, you will end up doing things to lose the very thing you feared losing. Oh, you better preach, Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, you see, when fear is your motivation, you, you got to understand that you will actually lose the very thing you're trying to keep. Here it is. You are not responsible for keeping what God has given you. You are responsible for taking care of it. You are responsible for nurturing it. You're responsible for growing it, but you can't keep it. Only the one who gave it can keep it. For the Lord giveth, and the Lord takes away. Some of y'all look at me confused, like what's he talking about? See, that's why some of you are so jealous and controlling in your relationships. Because you think it's your responsibility to keep her or him loyal. It's not your responsibility to keep them loyal. If God gave you the relationship, then you can do your best to manage it, to nurture it, to work on it, to take care of it. But if God gave it to you, it's his responsibility to keep it. See, Saul felt he could go outside of God's will because he was afraid of losing what he had, not knowing that if you trust God, what God gives you, no one can take away from you. So watch what happens. Saul is cowering in the cave, but Jonathan is dreaming of a maybe. He's saying maybe. I don't know the details of the plan, but maybe God will bless. See, because mature faith doesn't make decisions based on what you know, but mature faith makes decisions on who you know. The power of maybe. Can I push it a little bit further? Uh, understand then that, that this is not presumption. This is a call of faith to dream beyond the boundaries of one's imagination because we believe God can do the impossible. See, there are a few reasons why he could go forward on a maybe. Number one, Jonathan made up his mind, don't miss this, to join God to join what God was already doing. See, God had already made it plain that the Philistines were coming against his kingdom. God had already made his will clear. He wanted to defeat the Philistines. So sometimes you have to do what you already know God has revealed to you without knowing the details of the plan. Oh, I hope you're catching this. Uh, Jonathan understands God's sovereign will so that God gives him some room in the specific will. Jonathan acted on the part of God's will that he knew. Jonathan did not make up, watch this, Jonathan did not make up his mind to do something great for God. Jonathan made up his mind to do something great with God. Oh. I don't know if you're feeling it, but the Holy Ghost is preaching because some of you are getting in trouble because you're trying to do something for God. But how many of you know when you do something with God? See, see, Jonathan is joining what God is already doing. He knew God's big plan, and so he didn't need to know the details. Jonathan was willing to risk his life for the plan of God without knowing the details of the plan. Let me say it this way. Some of you are waiting for God to move while God is waiting on you to move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you've been waiting. I, I'm just standing here and waiting on the Lord. And there are some times when you have to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But more than often, God is up in heaven waiting on you to move. And you sitting up there paralyzed in analysis of your situation when he's saying, I already gave you power. I already equipped you. I gave you common sense. I gave you the Holy Ghost. There's resurrection 
resurrection. I don't have a church here. I gave you everything you need. There are some things he ain't coming down from heaven to fix because he gave you power to fix it. Like one of my students said to me, uh, Professor, Professor, would you pray for me? Pray that I pass this test. And I said, I'll pray, but have you studied? Because it's one thing for you to pray all day if, and to pray all day, Lord, help me. But if you never crack the book open, then you don't co-labor with God to work a miracle. And may I suggest to you that some of you, the reason why you haven't seen some things move in your life is because you haven't moved. Because the way it works is when you move, he moves. Okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, uh, this means that God leaves room in his will for you to experiment in faithful creativity because you are most like God when you are creating. When you are looking at difficulties and yet you see opportunities. A and you've got to be able to go forward on a maybe. It's the kind of faith that those, I like to call them those cotton field theologians had. You don't know the cotton field theologians. Those slaves down there in the south that were in the cotton fields and they looked down at their bare feet and they would say, I got shoes. You got shoes. All God's children got shoes. How can you look at bare feet and declare you got shoes? It's because when you got faith in God, you can be able to look at the impossible, to see things that aren't there, to create new opportunities. And I wonder if somebody here knows that the, the watch this, the doorway to a miracle is maybe. Because nothing changes until you say maybe. Dr. King and the civil rights movement to get, dared to say maybe. They, they said maybe now is the time to pray for equality. Maybe now we should push for voting rights. Maybe now we should march in the streets for justice. Maybe now we should fight for the rights of poor people. Maybe now we should fight for desegregation. They didn't hear a booming voice from heaven. They didn't sit up all night and wait for God to give them a sign. If they had not said maybe, we would not have the opportunities we have. If they had not said maybe, we would not be able to go to the schools and universities you went to. I wish I had a witness. If they had not said maybe you wouldn't be able to have that fancy corporate job you have I wish I had somebody if they had not said maybe you would not be able to go to that restaurant tomorrow morning and walk through the front door you'd have to go around to the back door and get you a brown paper bag and you understand that because they said maybe things change everything changes with a maybe and maybe we need to start saying maybe. Maybe we can stop young black children from being gunned down in the streets by crooked cops. Maybe we can stop the unfair treatment of women who are doing the same job but not getting equal pay. Maybe we can stop the racial profiling of our young black men. Maybe we can stop this prison industrial complex, this, 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 this system that brings brown and black men and takes them from third class, from classroom all the way to the, into prisons. Maybe, maybe we can bring this sadistic pedophile named R. Kelly to justice for stealing the lives of young black women. Maybe, and maybe, just maybe, we can vote this narcissist in chief out of the White House. Maybe every change begins with a maybe. Oh, y'all don't like that. Let me keep moving. Uh, that's number one. Number. He, he joined God in what he was already doing. Number two, number two, if you're going to go forward on maybe and have mature faith, watch this. You got to risk everything for God's glory. What Jonathan proposed was not reasonable. I want you to get this. What he proposed was not reasonable. And that's our problem with our church. We're too reasonable. We're too logical. We're too sensible. Think about it. When you only do what's in reason, when you only give what you can afford to give, when you only do what you can do, hear me, hear me, when you play it safe, you risk God getting the glory. You, you, you didn't 
catch it. When you play it safe, you risk God not getting the glory. You see, if you are planning to do, if what you are planning to do is reasonable without considerable, considerable risk to you, then it doesn't require faith in God. I, I, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to help somebody today. Let me say it again. If what you are planning to do is reasonable without considerable risk to you, then it does not require faith in God. And that's the problem with many of us is that we're playing around. We've got this kind of delayed faith, this immature faith that, that only allows us to exercise faith within the confines of our abilities. And that's not faith. That's skill. That's competence. That's intelligence. But faith goes beyond what you and I can do in order to do what only God can do. Okay, y'all not with me. So, so, so let me illustrate. I, I read the account of a girl, girl, a mother and girl, a, a, a daughter and, and her mother were having this conversation. And uh, the mother would say to the little girl, why don't you go outside and play with your friends? They keep coming and asking you to play. And you, you always stay in your room playing with your dolls. Why won't you go outside? I don't want to go outside and play with my friends. Why won't you? They keep coming every day. They want to play with you. And the daughter replied, well, the reason I don't want to go play with my friends and I'd rather play with my dolls is because uh, my friends won't do what I tell them to do. And, 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 when, and when I want to switch the game, they want to keep playing the game. And, and when I'm tired, they want to keep going. I can't control them. He, she said, but, but my dolls, uh, when the game, when I'm done with the game, the game is done. And, and when I want them to do something, I want them to sit in the position, I can make them sit there. And if I tell them not to move, they won't move. She said, I like playing with dolls because I can control them. And the church is just like the little girl. See, that's why we don't like to really talk about the Holy Ghost. We only give lip service. But the reason why we don't really want the Holy Ghost to move, uh, I feel something pushing me here. The reason why we don't want to do it is because the church likes playing with dolls. We don't want to hang out with the Holy Ghost. Because if we hung out with the Holy Ghost, guess what? He can't be controlled. If we let the Holy Ghost come in, he might just take over the program. If we, if we allow the Holy Ghost to come into our lives, he might just shut our mouths from saying stuff we plan to say but have no business saying. See, you got to understand that you got to step out into the place where you are out of control so that God can be in control. Uh, in fact, let me say it this way. God doesn't bless plans he blesses faith. Now, you should make a plan and you should have a strategy. There is a time and place for that. But hear what I'm saying. God doesn't bless your plan because it's smart or intelligent or, or effective. He only blesses your plan if there's faith in it. Uh, I, I, I knew it would be challenging today because we, we're trying to grow up, right, into mature faith, right? Uh, so so, so let, me, let me explain what I mean. Uh, God is so attracted to faith that wherever he finds faith, he will bless it. Because the Bible does not say that, that, that without Sabbath keeping, it is impossible to please him. It does not say without a proper understanding of the state of the dead, it is impossible to please him. It does not even say without commandment keeping, it is impossible to please him. I know I'm stepping on some toes, but the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. See, Jonathan's faith activated the move of God because God responds to faith, not plans. And in case you're wondering where I got this from, do you know what Saul and them were doing in the cave? They were coming up with a plan. Jonathan had faith in God, not a plan. Do you notice that Jonathan didn't tell Saul where he was going? <laughs> 
Notice who he took with him. He took an armor bearer. He was a young man because maybe Saul had been around too long to still believe God was able. Oh, God. Um, one of the things I understand here is that you can't take everybody to battle with you. Because sometimes you have expectations of people based on their position, but they're not able to come through. I wonder if I'm talking to somebody here who knows what I'm talking about. Uh, I like the fact that Jonathan asks his armor bearer but does not tell his father because his father has position but does not have faith. And you can't take everybody with you because sometimes your expectation might be out of order. Let me suggest to you, in fact, let me illustrate. I fly Delta. I fly Delta on a regular basis. I live in Atlanta. That's the hub of Delta. I like Delta. I've been flying with them for a long time. So I get certain perks now that I'm a platinum member. All right? Don't hate. Just congratulate. All right? And so I'm on a platinum level. And so, and so I, like, I like the perks that I get from being a platinum member at Delta. One day, one of my friends, David, one of my friends asked me to come preach at his church last minute. Because it was last minute, he couldn't afford the Delta ticket. So he said, I need to fly you on this uh, discount airline that will remain, remain nameless. Um, and so I'm like, okay, okay, my brother. Okay, I told you it would remain nameless. So, um, so, so, so here I am. Uh, I'm on this discount airline, all right? And, and, and I get up to about 10,000 feet, you know, the cruising. And, and I'm up there for now about 30, 40 minutes. And by now, Delta would have brought me those snacks. And by now, Delta would have brought me the stuff. And by now, I would have been served in a certain kind of platinum fashion until I realized, watch this, I had brought Delta expectations to a discount airline. And maybe one of the problems we have when we select people to take our journey with us is we choose discount people and we got Delta expectations. Come here, maybe that's why your heart keeps being broken. It's because you've got Delta expectations of a discount Negro. And maybe you've got to upgrade so that you can understand not everybody can take the journey with you. Is there anybody here that knows? You gotta have people with faith. You gotta have people with some Holy Ghost. You gotta have people with some resolve. You gotta have people with confidence. You got to have some ride or dies who believe God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above. I like Jonathan's boy because watch what he does. He says, he says, you, you going to go with me? Just you and I? He says, whatever's in your heart to do. Do it with all your heart and soul, and I am with you. And how many of you know you are not here by yourself, but you're here because you had a ride or die? You might not even know their name. It might have been somebody praying for you in the midnight hour, but you will not make it on this journey of maybe by yourself. Watch this. I'm almost through. He risked everything for God's glory. Last thing is... uh. He took action based on his faith in God's ability. This is mature faith. I want you to get this. Saul, don't miss this. Saul is cowering in a cave. 600 men. If you read 1 Samuel 13, the background of this text is that there are only two swords in all of Israel. Two. Philistines have cut off their, their military supply, so there's only two. Jonathan has one, huh, and Saul's got one. So Saul, uh, I'll enjoy this all by myself. Huh? Saul's cowering in the cave, and the reason he's in the cave is he's not only waiting, waiting to come up with a plan. Watch this. He's there because he's counted his resources. And his resources say he's only got one sword. And, and the reason he can't move forward to attack the enemy is because his resources are limited. But Jonathan takes another inventory. 
He is not counting swords. Jonathan, look what he says. It may be the Lord. Saul is counting swords. Jonathan is counting on the Lord. And you will never move forward on a maybe if you're stuck on your limited resources. Because how many of you know you'll never have enough? You will never have everything you think you need for the journey. Because God wants to set it up so that you understand that your resource is not your resources. But your resource is the God who gave you the plan in the first place. And if you just go forward on a maybe, he will provide what you need when you start moving forward. Here's a problem. Saul is sitting up there, and I, and I, wrote, I read those texts so that you'd see. He's got a priest wearing an ephod, right? The ephod, right? The ephod, if you don't know what that was, it was this necklace that they would wear with two huge jewels on each side, and they would pray, and God would speak, and one of them would light up on either side to tell them what they were supposed to do. Ah, don't miss this. They're sitting up in the cave, waiting for the ephod to light up. Someone knows where I'm going. They're stuck on what God did last time. They're stuck on a tradition of how God spoke in the past. But believers are not bound by past blessings. Watch this. Sometimes the greatest enemy to your future blessing is the love of your last one. And some of the reason why you can't move forward is because you waiting on God to do what he did last time. You waiting on God for speak the, to speak the way he spoke last time. You're stuck on a past blessing, so there's no room in your life for a future deliverance. Mm, you better preach, Holy Ghost. Uh, let me illustrate. One of my friends tells this story. One of my friends in Huntsville tells this story of how he would take his kids all the time to Chuck E. Cheese. They would get in the car. His kids would get in the back seat, and then he would announce, we're going to a special place. And they would yell out, yay, Chuck E. Cheese. They would, he would take them to Chuck E. Cheese, where they would go and play those video games and eat that stale pizza and just have a good time. They, they loved going to Chuck E. Cheese. They'd get in the car. He'd announce, we're going to a special place. They'd yell out, Yay, Chuck E. Cheese. Well, one day he got in the car, packed them in the back, and he said, we're going to a special place. They yelled out, yay, Chuck E. Cheese. He said, no, we ain't going to Chuck E. Cheese. They began to complain. They began to argue. One of them burst out in tears that they couldn't go to Chuck E. Cheese. The other one was upset and whining and complaining. Daddy, why won't you take us to Chuck E. Cheese? He said, trust me, I'm going to a special place, but, but we're not going to Chuck E. Cheese. They upset with the daddy. They got an attitude with the daddy because he's not taking them where he used to but little did they know he had secretly packed their bags put them in the trunk and they did not know that they didn't notice that they had left the confines of that city and they were now on the highway. They thought that the best thing to do was to go to Chuck E. Cheese but what they did not understand is that their daddy was taking them to Disney World and they were complaining on the way to a better blessing because they were stuck on a Chuck E. Cheese blessing when God had a Disney World anointing. And could it be that you stuck on what God did yesterday, but today there's a bigger blessing? I wish somebody would just praise God with me that God has greater in the future, that God has better in the future, that God has bigger in the future. If you could just say maybe. My time is up. I gotta go. So let me tell you what happened. Uh, this is his sign. Oh, God. Uh, this is his sign. He says, okay, here's the plan. We're going to go forward on a maybe. He says, here's how we know God is with us. He said, now, I want you to see it now. They're standing up on this side of this cavern. On the other side is the Philistines. He said, here's our plan. We're going to come out from hiding. 
We're going to go down into the cavern and we're going to expose ourselves. We're going to show them where we are. And, and here's how we know God is with us. If they come down to us, we'll be on a level fighting field. It'll be too easy so we know God's not with us. You just missed it. Because everyone knows in military advantage that you never give up the high ground. So he says, we'll show ourselves, and if they come down to us, we might be in trouble. Huh? He said, but here's how we know God is with us. If they tell us to climb the mountain up to where they are, then we know that God has given them into our hands. Now, you just missed your shout because perhaps you don't understand what Jonathan said. He said, in other words, if we climb up to them, we will wear ourselves out in the process. And by the time we get up to the top of the mountain, we'll be out of breath and out of strength. But that's how we know that God is about to move. Because the reason why, Miracle City, we don't see miracles is because we don't place ourselves in a position for God to work a miracle. But is there anybody here that knows that the secret to seeing a miracle is to step out on a maybe? To put yourself in a position where if God doesn't rescue you, you're going to lose everything. If God doesn't come through, everything will be lost. And the Bible says that the men looked down. They said, there are those Philistines coming out of their cave. They say, come up to us and we'll show you a thing or two. Jonathan looks at his armor bearer and says, it just became impossible. So now we know God is in it. They begin to climb up the mountain. And as they climb up the mountain, they're using upper body strength that they really need to conserve for the fight. As they climb up the mountain, they're using energy they need to swing their sword. And by the time they got up the mountain, they were all out of breath. But that's when God begins to move. Because my Bible says that his strength is made perfect in my weakness and what the enemy didn't know is that when he caused you trouble he was an accessory to your deliverance because when it becomes impossible do I have 10 people do I have 20 people who know when it becomes impossible God is getting ready to move shout yeah Say yeah! He specializes in the impossible. He does things that you can do. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Go forward on a maybe. Go forward on a maybe. You may not know how, but you do know who. And I wonder if there's somebody here who can praise God right now. I'm gonna go forward. Last thing, I promise last thing. I told you there were two swords in all of Israel. Why would God leave them with only two swords? Because it was never God's intention for them to win the battle with swords. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty unto God. I wish I had a few people here that know we don't fight with swords, but this is how we fight. We fight in the spirit. We fight with faith. We believe he is a Jesus climbed a mountain on a maybe. 
He went to the cross on a maybe. He said, if I die for them, maybe they'll give their lives. If I shed my blood, maybe they'll believe. Church, it's time to go forward. It's time to grow up and go forward on a maybe. Everyone stand to your feet. Everyone stand to your feet. My time is through. Very quickly, very quickly. If you're here today, if you're here, if you're here, if you're here today, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, and you've been, you've been waiting on God to move, could it be that God's been waiting on you to move? You've been trying to get all the details of the plan, and you're frustrated in your faith because you haven't figured out yet that God does not give all the details. He never has. He reveals his sovereign will, and then he asks you to trust him. And sometimes you got to go forward on the part of the plan you know about. Because it will not be fully revealed until you start moving. You got to go forward on a maybe. And if you go forward on a maybe, God is so attracted to faith that even if your idea is so crazy, as long as it brings him glory, he will bless it. He will. And so if you're here and you've been struggling in your faith because you wanted to know all the details and I've been there, I've been frustrated. God, tell me, just order my steps. Tell me every step and I'll take it. He doesn't always order every step. He shows you the destination. He will show you step one, but you've got to start taking step two and three. And if you're here, you've been frustrating your faith. You're saying, preacher, I need for you to pray for me that I'll start moving forward in faith. Grow up in my faith and go forward on a maybe if you're here. And I want to pray for you in a special way. Would you slip down just to the front? I want to pray for you. I've been frustrated in my faith. I've been waiting for God to do some things. And today you've come to understand that he's really been waiting on you. He already empowered you. He already gave you wisdom. He gave you spiritual people around you. All of the resources you, you, you need, you already have. What he's asking us to do is to go forward on a maybe. There's some things God placed in your spirit. You looked at your resources and you said, I can't do it. But today now you understand he is your resource. There's some things that, that, that you don't understand. You're asking God, work this relationship. Work this relationship out. And, and God has shown you some things. Hear me, hear me. He's shown you some things. He's opened up your eyes. He's revealed some things. And you want God to break it off. He ain't going to come down from heaven and break it off. He's waiting for you to do what you know you need to do. And will you know every detail absolutely not it's not how he works he told Abraham start going to the region of Moriah I will show you the mountain when you start moving I will not tell you now I only will reveal it when you move gotta go forward on a maybe it's not presumption it's faith when you know that it's going to bring God glory. When you risk your life for his glory, go forward on a maybe. And here is the confidence we have. That if you go forward on a maybe for his glory, he will deliver you. He will. I'm a living witness. He will. Quickly, quickly, quickly. There's one other group. If you're here today, if you're here today, and you've been in church, but you're not in Christ. You're in this service, but Jesus is not your savior. You're here and you're like, I haven't given my life because I don't know all the details of how it works to be a Christian. Here's my appeal to you. Why don't you go forward on a maybe? Go forward on a maybe. You don't need to know all the details of how he will get you out of what you're into. Just go forward on a maybe. And here's the confidence that if you come to Christ, he will make you a new creation. So if you're here today, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to join the church. If you're not already down here, would you join us? Just, just raise your hand. Say, that's me. That's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to join the church. 
I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to trust him. He's trustworthy. He's not just worthy of my praise. He's worthy of trust. I, I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to go forward on a maybe. He went forward on a maybe for me. I'm going to go forward on a maybe for him. Even now as I get ready to pray, that's your prayer. Pray it in your heart, Father. We thank you that you sent Jesus to go forward on a maybe. There was no guarantee that we would accept his sacrifice. And yet he went forward anyway. In faith in his ability to save us. Oh God, would you please grow us up in our faith? to stop trusting what we see and start trusting what you said? Would you grow us up in our faith, oh God? Make us mature so that we can go forward and create opportunities out of difficulties, to see the blessing in burdens, to go forward and see trials as opportunities to bring you glory. God, would you please increase our faith? Develop our faith, Lord, so that we will shout and praise and worship, not just when things are well, but to shout in advance, knowing that the battle is not ours, it's yours, and that we are surrounded by your presence. So we have victory guaranteed. I pray in a special way for those who have come and pressed to the front. Lord, I pray that you would help them to realize their spiritual resources. Take their eyes off what they don't have. Put their eyes on who they do have. And I pray, God, that you will give them faith to boldly go into 2019 and do things they never dreamed they could do. We thank you in advance for the battles that will be won. And we're going forward on a maybe in Jesus name let everybody say amen amen come on shout hallelujah give him glory hey thanks so much for watching I pray that you were blessed by this message we'd love to connect with you beyond this moment so I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel um, you'll get updates on when a new sermon is posted as well as when we go live during our worship experiences uh, on Saturdays at 12 p.m. Uh, also, you can connect with us on social media. You can go to Facebook or Instagram and look for Miracle City Church. And on Twitter, you can find us at Miracle City Life. We really do believe that God's doing something special in this congregation and in this family. And we're so blessed that you've chosen um, to connect with us. And if you've been blessed and you want to be a blessing, we invite you to go to our website. You can find all the information for giving there by going to miraclecitychurch.org slash give. And we know the Lord will bless you for your generosity. Thanks so much for being part of what God is doing here. And we pray many blessings on your life.